Chapter 9. Can't make a sound. What led at last to some slight shift in the direction of better health was a Google search. At wit's end, Elliot tapped in the word heroin. That took him to a Heroin Times essay on Lou Reed, about Reed studying poetry with mentor Delmore Schwartz, an alcoholic speed addict for whom he wrote two songs, Our House and European Sun. Sections described Reed shooting up on stage, acting as a sort of poster boy for heroin chic. Others noted his fine blend of street wisdom and book knowledge, the way he gave voice to the downtrodden and repressed, how he kicked his habit through the help of Alcoholics Anonymous. The Velvet Underground may have started Reed's adulthood, but AA saved it. <clears throat> it's my wife, it's my life, Reed had written, tersely summing up what heroin had become for him. Elliot captures the same sentiment in King's Crossing. All I want to do now is inject my ex-wife. The ex adjective more wish than reality in all likelihood. Also, by all accounts, Elliot never shot up. Reed, the essay continues, dons his blue mask to simultaneously reveal the raw vulnerability and live wire sensitivity beneath it. The theme of compassion emerges, its necessity for true healing, especially in a form directed toward the self. In the end, Elliot's beloved Nico even appears, saying, I find it hard to believe you don't know the beauty you are. Elliot read on with building interest, even a sense of hope. Here was, first of all, a writer who seemed to know what he was talking about, someone who had been there and crawled out. Here also was the prototypical addict, heroine's New York hero. If Reed could do it, if Reed had found something useful in AA, of all places, then why not him? After all, Elliot was decidedly minor league compared to Reed. Reed was heroin, a kind of living symbol. On the other hand, maybe it was all bullshit, Elliot figured, hyperbole, wishful thinking. Did Reed really do this? Was he really clean? So with Valerie along for the ride, Elliot showed up at the Heroin Times offices in Malibu. He wanted to know who had written the article who had made these claims. He was on a kind of fact-checking mission. As it happened, Nelson Gary sat at the front desk. He was the author, he said, and all of it was true. At first, Elliot was skeptical, but Gary knew people who knew Reed. He wasn't making anything up. He'd done his homework. It was all fact. Besides, Gary wondered, why doubt it? Why the incredulity? <clears throat> when Elliot arrived, he was pissed off. Gary had no clue who he was. He looked homeless, and to Gary he seemed at first delusional. Sounding like some two-bit wannabe with nothing to show for himself, a faux artiste, a faux songwriter, he railed against the radio and why he wasn't on it more. He complained about the need to tour. As for fame, he wanted it. It made him sick, but at the same time, he felt he had been overlooked. I don't think he was coming from a narcissistic place, Gary said. He just heard people on the radio sounding like him and making lots of money. He was interested in acknowledgement in the broadest sense possible. As the two talked, Elliot finally cooled down some. At one point, someone whispered in Gary's ear, cluing him in on whom he was speaking with. It caught Gary off guard, but he quickly realized that one of the reasons Elliot listened, maybe the only reason, was that Gary hadn't recognized him. He wasn't some sort of star fucker. He was, for all he knew, talking to a complete nobody. Elliot found something instantly endearing about that. We hit it off, Gary says, but it was an edgy relationship. He was cerebral, and I'd be contrary for the hell of it. Elliot adored the Beatles, Gary figured out, so he dissed them cajolingly, telling Elliot he was living a much more Rolling Stones life. 
They argued about who was better, and Elliot was a scrapper. He was a junkyard dog. I wouldn't say he got mean, but he could defend himself. He had all the intellectual subject matter, but he was doing stuff, too, not just talking about it. He wasn't an encyclopedia with shoes, Gary recognized. Over time, they met about once or twice per month, as friends, not as therapists slash patient. patient. Gary was a painter, writer, poet, an exuberant, inventive, spoken word performer, his lexicon impressively large. He quoted easily from Kierkegaard to Hinduism, Nietzsche to Coltrane. His mother, Jan Fuller, was a feminist who appeared on numerous talk shows, and his wife worked in the music industry, so he knew his artists inside and out, a major Dylan, Bowie, and Stones fan. His job revolved around addiction treatment. He counseled at Malibu Ranch and then transitioned to program director at the Malibu Coast Treatment Center. He was well-versed in the vicissitudes of detox, and he understood intimately the complications of dual diagnosis, Elliot's struggle. Depression engendered drug use. Drug use magnified depression. The former had to be treated just as aggressively as the latter. It was a multi-pronged attack, or it was nothing. Welcome back to Southwest Studios and Media GTAO. So we're stopping there because we definitely need to recognize the dual diagnosis nature of Elliot Smith's mental health and addictions issues, as I've touched on previously, but I'm not a clinician. I'm not a professional addictions person. Um, so you kind of heard it there. Um, now Gary was his counselor as well. I guess I'm a little confused there. I'm just going to pause. Okay, having looked at it, he wasn't Elliot's counselor, but he was a counselor at the Malibu Coast Treatment Center. And so, I don't need to, you know, so we're looking at dual diagnosis, um, depression being the main complication, and I quote, Depression engendered drug use. Drug use magnified depression. The former had to be treated just as aggressively as the latter end quote. So, hope your Christmases were good, and it was good talking with you yesterday, feeling a little bit better, at least in the voice, and, you know, as much as I had a good Christmas myself, and I hope everyone did, I'm glad that it's over, and I tend to feel that way every year is a little bit relieved after Christmas. Just, it seems like this building pressure to uh, have joy, and as Ebenezer Scrooge talked about in A Christmas Carol, he's like all the people smiling at each other on this one day of year, when the other 364, they walk around with nastiness in their hearts, and I don't know if that's true, you know, but it's like, are you a phony on Christmas? How many, how many Merry Christmases are meant, and how many are a lie? That's a big Scrooge thing there. So, are you a phony on Christmas? I don't know. <laughs> um, but now it's over. So, get back to your regularly scheduled shitty selves. Uh, keep abusing and slapping each other. And uh, being horrible and selfish. Page 295. Although he's not sure what kind of direct impact it had, one idea Gary introduced to Elliot was Tamil Sita, or Tantric Twilight Language, also called Intentional Language. At the time, Gary was mesmerized by it, the idea of expanding the mind by deliberate use of opposites, a dialectical synthesis achieved through paradoxical juxtaposition. Gary isn't certain it had anything strictly to do with him, but Elliot wound up retitling the song Somebody's Baby, Twilight, and it does, in the recorded version, include several Sita-like antitheses, laughing so hard he cries, being with someone only to disappoint her in the process, and loving two dissimilar women at once. But if the idea ever reached an apex, it was with the song coast to coast. 
What Ellie was after, Gary believes, was a specific, complex healing. Catharsis without resolution. Or as Elliot himself put it in the song's two opening lines, confused resolution. He told Gary his character was a preacher, a circuit rider, traveling from town to town, in love with two women, one stable and boring, one signifying chaos, the final detail duplicating the theme of Twilight. Gary goes on, Elliot sings repeatedly about doing something for a certain you, feeling that he has already done things for this you a number of times, and he has nothing new for them. Every reviewer I've read misinterpreted this. They were too focused on the artist, not the art. They wrote things such as, I've got nothing new for you, is a joke, it's silly. That's true, but as an artist, he was attempting to get people to pay attention to the art, not him, ultimately. The you he is addressing is one fictionalized romantic love interest, the road girl, a second romantic fictionalized love interest, the stay-at-home girl, or wife. God, and to some degree, the general audiences he seduces, going from revival tent to revival tent. Those the speak roads, Gary suggested of the sacred and profane. He often told him, the intermingling of the two is the only place true holiness can exist. The lowness of the high, the low in the high, the profound, even potentially holy relationship between them, that's one of the major things Elliot was investigating. For the song, Gary was brought in to provide a waterfall of words, or John Coltrane, Sheet of Sounds. They recorded on Good Friday in Hollywood. Stephen Drosdy was on drums. So was Autumn DeWild's husband, Aaron Spierski of Beechwood Sparks. Gary had a poem in hand. He recorded it in voiceover numerous times, take after take. Elliot wanted a range of personas, different accents, different attitudes. He would say, Miss it, but be late, or Miss it, but be early. His intent was for the words to sound obliquely off, never managing to find any sort of groove or rhythm. I went by the lower notes of his guitar playing, says Gary. But the song begins with machine whining, Industrial mineshaft scraping. Drums awake fumblingly at first, hibernating large animals, resentful at having their slumber interrupted, then crash in obligingly aside electric guitar. Elliot says two words, preachy and pushy, as piano chords tumble. There's nothing new, Elliot says, no new act to amuse, no desire to use. Anything he does would not be good enough anyway. He figures he'll just forget it. It's really easy to do. If you can't help it, just leave it alone. He introduces the circuit rider who comes every fifth Sunday. And Gary, in two different studio-altered voices, appears over a tinkling piano tracing a high, haunting melody, in some ways the most powerful moment in the song. For reasons Gary never understood, Elliot recorded himself saying, That's why, as the piano fades. He seemed to mean it as a reaction to some line in the poetry, but it's hard to say. It may be more randomness, more meaningless noise. Everything done, the subject of money arose, awkwardly. Gary had assumed he'd be compensated, and he was, a total of $1,500. Elliot said initially, I thought we were doing this as two artists. Gary's impulsive reply, tell that to David Geffen. It wasn't a serious disagreement, however. Things ended on very good terms. Besides, there was a lot more to talk about, namely emotional pain and drugs, and what to do about each, how to move past them somehow, if possible. 
Gary's sense, based on hashing the subject out with Elliot in detail, was that childhood trauma had permanently changed him, that there was little chance of reversing its effects. He had tried being okay with himself, being accepting, but radical acceptance only went so far. It didn't change the facts, obviously, and more important, Elliot continued to feel angry. Although he tried, his attitude was not always one of equanimity. There was shame, too, self-hatred, confusion, loss. The two discussed how drugs functioned as an extension of trauma, a form of self-abuse, of administering the torture on yourself. One becomes his own destroyer, in other words. Gary was also aware of cutting incidents, occasions on which Elliot harmed himself superficially. It was another piece of it, more marks of self-loathing. None of this was new to Elliot. He knew what was going on. The question was, did he really want to change it? Did he want to take it on, or did he want to let it slowly destroy him? The answer currently, though tentatively, was no. Then it was back to Lou Reed. AA, the best path to take. Gary put Elliot in touch with Jerry Schopenkopf. Jerry Schoenkopf, an addiction specialist with a history of working with rock star junkies. Jerry's memories that he first met Elliot in 1996 under unclear circumstances. At any rate, the connection was made, and it deepened. Jerry and Elliot never went more than one month without talking. They met consistently, although somewhat sporadically. To Jerry, Elliot was smart, a true intellectual, and very sweet, but also very depressed, and using drugs to get more depressed, as he saw it. Just like depressed people do, he used alcohol, heroin, any downer, to deepen the depression. The two reviewed Elliot's abuse and detox history, how he'd get better, stop getting better, then get worse. There was a sense that he was fragmenting, that he was tired, that the drugs for depression weren't cutting it. In fact, as Jerry examined Elliot's drug regimen, he began to feel this is not the right stuff. Psych drugs can be a problem, he said. We had long talks about psychiatry. Psych drugs can only take you so far. I don't want to say it wrong, but what Elliot was on, it, it didn't work. A hardly uncommon reality, with anywhere from one-third to one-half of depressed patient, patients treatment refractory, i.e. drugs don't help them at all. What Jerry counseled was complete abstinence, it's playing with matches, heroin, and you're a baby. Elliot's center was fragile, Jerry felt, and he couldn't afford to wobble. It's not like he could try to become a weekend heroin user. His core was too unstable. You can't compete with these drugs, he'd say, and Elliot agreed. He was obsessively interested in them, on one hand, but he also knew he was losing his capacity to be creative. Thick. I feel like I'm already dead. This was, in many ways, a do-or-die realization. Destroying any other part wouldn't have mattered in the least. It was what Elliot was busily doing, tempting fate with overdoses, with murderous drug combos. He placed little value on his life. He was sick of it. But the music was something else. It was the one thing, maybe the only thing, he did not want to disappear. Losing it was losing the last bit of hope he had, his one reason for trying. If, in some crazy magical reality, he could die and the music could go on, that would be fine. He'd be good with that. Yet there was no magical reality. As he'd figured out long ago, to keep making music he needed to sacrifice. He needed, that is, to give up death, his attraction to ending everything, to numbness, emptiness, isolation, 
he needed to choose life, whether he wanted it or not. This was the perpetual struggle. Why not kill yourself? The question rarely left him. And the answer, the only answer ever, was music. For now, at least, he could not lose it. He wasn't ready to let it go, too. Okay, well, we'll look at that. We'll look at that a little bit here. Um, first of all, computer, per usual, doing some funny things. So if there were some skipped words in there, sorry. And if not, then bonus. Showing the seams a little bit behind the production, sure. But I want you to know that, that I know. So this, again, it so much reminds me of Kurt Cobain. Because Cobain as well was doing a lot of intentional overdoses, according to, I believe, Heavier Than Heaven. Because Love and Death does not really talk about Kurt trying to die through his heroin overdoses, but Heavier Than Heaven, which, again, recall, um, was authorized by Courtney Love, has Kurt ODing in the back of cars up in Seattle slums. But not to digress too much on that, it's just... If that part of Kurt's life is true, it really reminds me of that. Elliot's ODs here, because I certainly believe Elliot was trying to OD. That's what everyone was saying. That's what the author was saying. And even though the author does have some weird turns of phrase from time to time, I mean, it's a pretty good book, even though I bitched about it. Now, hmm. I want to quote this one part and you know be bored if you want but we're giving Elliot the respect and silence and time that he deserves here I don't want to rush any of this stuff and um yeah so let's see here you know he wanted to live on through the through the music yeah, I'll pause all right sorry quote if, in some crazy magical reality, he could die and the music could go on, that would be fine. He'd be good with that. End quote. And I think that's what happened. You know, as we look at him, as you listen to him, whenever you feel like it. Um, sometimes when you're depressed, sure. Although I think Elliot really gets that, that rap, that reputation for being the music you go to when you're depressed. And I just think... I don't see that with albums like Figure Eight or EXO. They're full of joy and life and love. So I just think people who say that are wrong. But he does live on. It's Sometimes it's even hard to talk about Elliot Smith in the past tense, you know, because I uh, sometimes you just feel like you know him. You just feel like you know him because he's funny and uh, he's the kind of guy you want on your side. It's easy to be jealous of him because he's so freaking talented. So if you're a musician friend of his, then yeah, you might be jealous of him. But it seems like the kind of guy you can't help but love. In some ways, uh, I don't know, he might be a little bit similar to Isaac Brock or something. Not, that at all, not to at all compare the two. But Isaac Brock seems like a weird-ass motherfucker who's singular, I guess is the word I'm going for. And also very talented. Uh, two different... Two different styles of music, sure, but they, Modest Mouse and Elliot Smith and Heat Miser were certainly playing <coughs> a lot of the same locations and around the same time in the in the nineties in Portland um, and all all along the West Coast area. So why do I bring up Isaac Brock? I don't know. You really shouldn't mention Isaac Brock and Elliot Smith in the same sentence, but only to point out their lovability. I guess I think Isaac Brock's pretty lovable guy. Um, and I'm not, just to point out too, I don't worship Elliot Smith or any man, um, only my definition of God. Um, and so it does annoy me when comments are like, how dare you do that? You know, during the Kristen Path video, um, why did you laugh dur at the 10 minute mark? How disrespectful. It's like, bitch, shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. All right. I don't want to see your shitty comments. And because Christmas is over, I can go back to being a shitty person. Thank you. So, Elliot, you know, your music does live on. 
and you didn't have to kill yourself for that to happen. But I know that wasn't the goal. And what I, the reason we stopped here is because the music, whether in Kurt's life or Elliot's life, was what kept them going. It was the last glimmer of hope towards the very end. But as Elliot told Jennifer Chiba, he feels like he's already dead. So. <clears throat> There was something else at work, something that made daily life a living hell. The drugs had fomented a fierce paranoia, in some respects more destructive than the substances themselves. Some days Elliot believed in these fears, others he saw them for what they were, side effects of continuously damaged chemistry. The one way out, he realized during saner moments, was to stop using Sean Sullivan recalls a late-night trip to a Burger King drive through The truck behind was revving its engine, and Elliot latched on to the idea that it was following him. He began to see all these coincidences, Sullivan says. It was standard textbook stuff. He thought his car was bugged. He thought DreamWorks was tracking him, breaking into his home and stealing songs. Once he decided scores of people were hiding in the grass outside his home, invisibly spying. At 4 a.m., he headed to an all-night Home Depot, his plan to buy a machete and cut the grass back. But the main fixation was white vans. He saw them everywhere, and white cars. As he drove around L.A., he took pictures of license plates of suspicious vehicles, then uploaded them into his computer as evidence, scores and scores of arbitrary images. He also recorded a running monologue, documenting what he was seeing, making imaginary connections in his head. Clearly, fear was rendering him psychotic. Everyone around him knew he was out of his mind, the paranoia erupting over and over, hard to predict. Most of the time it was fruitless to talk with him about it. It pissed him off to be questioned, and he sometimes folded the questioner into the delusional mindset, saying, You are part of it too? Deep down, however, he held on to slipping insight. He'd say to friends, I sound like I'm totally batshit crazy, don't I? Jerry discussed with him the chemical aspects. First off, crack caused delusions. This was amphetamine psychosis, a dopamine-driven paranoia. To stop it, he'd need to stop the drugs. It was simple. But there was more to an additional difficulty. If you take these drugs long enough, Jerry explained, and then you stop, the paranoia stays and finds a home in your brain. So there were chemical elements and psychological ones. Combating the fear required a multidimensional approach, no more drugs combined with psychological insight into their sequela. Nelson Gary chimed in too, his sense of things a bit more nuanced, more emotional than clinical. He certainly had depression, that's for sure, said Gary. In terms of the paranoia, Elliot was a cutter. You become very raw. What happens is you can get into a very sort of oceanic experience and a lot of uncertainty, and it's scary. He opened himself up, he opened himself up to a lot of stuff in the music and songs like Coast to Coast and King's Crossing, and it ripped him apart. His strengths were also his weaknesses. He was stepping out and taking a chance as an artist. The new songs were different and his fans weren't prepared for it. That fear with drugs, with abuse, with depression, led to the paranoia. In the end, Elliot's sensitivity was his undoing. Paranoia is really just hypersensitivity. Whatever the proximate causes, and depression alone is another, it's mood-congruent delusions. The question was how to stop the fear, 
how to not stop the music. Elliot couldn't do AA. He could not honestly take the first step, which required admitting he was at the mercy of a higher power. Power was an idea he had always rejected totally. So in August 2002, he latched onto a biological remedy, a decidedly fringe medical solution called neurotransmitter restoration, developed initially by William Hitt. It was fast, it promised a 10-day detox. It claimed to produce substantially reduced withdrawal, decreased cravings, restored mental clarity. NTR, as practitioners called it, intravenously saturated the body with nutrients, naturally occurring amino acids, minerals, and buffers, stimulating, the theory said, a cell shift into repair mode, with drug-damaged neurons returning to normal functioning, brain receptor sites coated with a cool, wet blanket. Detox from crystal meth might require one amino acid and mineral solution, heroin and alcohol another. The tonic was determined by the specific case. Elliot described the process to an interviewer, clearly at this point a believer. What they do is an IV treatment where they put a catheter in your arm and you're on a drip bag But the only thing that's in the drip bag is amino acids and saline solution. I was coming off a lot of psych meds and other things. I was even on an antipsychotic, although I'm not psychotic. It was really difficult. It's usually a 10-day process, but for me it took a lot longer. It just bombards your system with amino acids that kick all the shit out of your nerve receptors. He continued, there's such a taboo of even talking about drug use, and then there's the added problem if you play music. Then there's this sort of melodrama that surrounds it, which wouldn't necessarily surround someone who doesn't play music, so it's kind of an off-limits subject. Actually, I thought I would just try to avoid it, but I'm not different from other people with drug problems. So given the opportunity to speak, then I guess I will. Jerry wasn't a fan, nor was most anyone with an appropriately critical mindset. I think little of it, he said. They look at your history, then come up with a soup of amino acids. His belief was it was essentially garbage, at a cost of $1,000 per day, a minimum $10,000 total. Once you take the IV out, it's bullshit. It doesn't work. Jerry knew of HIT. He was a big, good-looking, charismatic guy who spoke with confidence, employing soothingly scientific language that seemed, in his mouth, legit. He was persuasive, but questions dogged him. New Zealand's listener checked into his background in an investigative piece. They found a total absence of undergraduate or medical degrees, a fact hit admitted to in sworn documents filed with a court. He'd claimed audaciously to have a Nobel Prize. That, too, was false, as was his claim of an Eli Lilly Award. There were also contentions that Hit, now deceased, doctored test results. Elliot never questioned Hit, nor his credentials. And despite the inherent illogic of the treatment, its flimsy conceptual foundations, he believed strongly that it had helped. It was grueling. For a time it left him reeling, but he did feel restored, rejuvenated, as if something deep had shifted in him. Did it cure the paranoia? No. The lingering, the fears lingered, although they became less consuming. And his hope now that he'd made an honest stab at getting clean, was that slowly as the fog cleared, the creative capacity might return with fresh force. But something unexpected happened. In the midst of all this change, the effort to turn things in a promising direction, one consistent with life, a new conflict 
emerged. Okay. As far as the content goes for today, um, that is where we are going to leave it. And this is the kind of material and information that I've kind of been alluding to um, in my commentary this entire audiobook. So, as I said, I had read this before. I knew there was some Dr. Kook at the end who fucked... (coughs) (laughs) Who fucked up Elliot's shit. Um, Yeah, and even I'm joking on it, right? This guy hit no degrees, no credentials. Elliot's saying that he does feel better. He's got Nelson Gary and this guy... Shonko for something? I can't pronounce his last name. That's why I keep calling him Jerry, but it's like Jerry Shop. I don't know. I don't want to lose whatever flow I think I have. But Elliot does have these uh, professionals surrounding him. I think it's. it still seems to me that Gary is like a, a friend of Elliot's who happens to be a substance abuse counselor, but not necessarily Elliot's counselor. And, you know, guys, it's not... Uh, It's not really my job to uh, analyze this as it goes along. So I don't particularly care. Um, I'm very distracted by my computer program, Audacity. It's been tweaking the whole time. So forget that, though. That's more of a me just telling you where I'm coming from, all right, being um, transparent. So that aside, it does look like it's working. Um, So Elliot does have these professionals surrounding him and so when he goes to hit to get this weird amino acid treatment at the cheap cost of a thousand dollars per day minimum 10 days which by the way if you don't know it's a scam at that point clearly if you have a 10 day minimum thousand dollars per day uh, amino acids it's not really provable i can understand wanting to detox there's really no science behind this um as we can see you know yeah yeah so I quote, they found a total absence of undergraduate or medical degrees, end quote. So Hit admitted that. Claims he has a Nobel Prize. You got to be one ballsy motherfucker. You know, it's, it just sounds like Elliot fell in with a huckster in L.A. Um, and it, 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 the, the kind of person who takes advantage of the vulnerability and addiction of someone like Elliot, who also has that kind of money, you know, it's uh, vultures, vultures in Hollywood. And so Elliot's saying it did help. He feels rejuvenated. Um, And, you know, something unexpected happens, which honestly, I don't know what it is. But we are going to end there for today. I don't have anything particularly wise or brilliant to say here. Not that I ever have. Lately, we're doing a lot of reading, which is good. Um, Looking into chapter nine here. Is this chapter nine? It is a long chapter, baby. It's probably going to be another three-parter. Yeah, chapter nine, can't make a sound. This goes on to page 321, and I'm on page 301 at the page break here. In case you happen to be following along. Um, I might be going out of town, doing some traveling. Who knows? I'm bored out of my freaking mind here. Um, And it looks like some of the snow is starting to melt, making roads a little nicer. I do hope you had great Christmas. Um, but as I said, return to murdering people and whatever it is you do in your free time gambling and, um, yeah. So I want to thank you for joining me during this holiday season. I ain't going anywhere. At least, uh, you know, I'll be back in a few days if I do. So I do need something from you now. Go ahead and like this video and leave a comment. For now, this has been Media Gito saying, have a nice day.